I'd like to talk about the idea of double integrals now. As a prelude to that, we'll think about what went on in Calculus 1. You defined the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx to be the limit of the Riemann sums in the usual way. Only later did you develop techniques like the fundamental theorem of calculus in which you can evaluate such things using antiderivatives. For regions in a plane, we're going to follow a similar plan. We're going to take a region R of the two-dimensional plane and divide it into smaller two-dimensional regions, each one of which will have instead of a length, an area to go with it. So I'm going to call the area of chunk number i, delta a number i. We need an analog for all of the delta x's going to zero. We'll want all of these subregions to shrink down to points. So if you want to be technical about it, let capital D i be the diameter of the smallest circle that contains chunk number i, and for the norm of the partition, instead of the biggest delta x, we'll have the biggest diameter. If this number, norm of partition, tends to zero, then all the diameters tend to zero. All subregions shrink down to points then. Other than that, we proceed in an exactly similar way to what we did in Calculus 1. Select a point xi, yi within subregion number i. Evaluate the function f at that representative point. Multiply it by a quantity that represents how big the subchunk is. It used to be delta x, which was a length. Now it'll be delta A number I, which is the area. This is a Riemann sum in a certain sense. If the limit as the norm of the partition tends to zero of these Riemann sums exist, we give it a very fancy looking name. We call it the double integral over region R of f of x and y integrated with respect to area in the xy plane. This is just a fancy name for this limit. At this time, we don't know how to calculate any such thing. What we need is some sort of analog to the fundamental theorem of calculus, also known as the antiderivative trick, which says if little f is continuous on the interval from a to b, and if you can find an antiderivative capital F, then this definite integral is just the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. Luckily, we have a result for certain types of regions. This is called Fubini's theorem. If R is a vertically simple region of the type the x values can be anything from A to B, and the y values vary from some function alpha x to beta of x, then it's possible to calculate this double integral with an iterated integral. Fubini's theorem states that the double integral in such a case of f of x, y with respect to area in the x, y plane is the integral from a to b with respect to x, that would be the outside portions, of the integral from alpha x to beta x of f of x and y integrated with respect to y. Despite appearances, that inside integral contains no reference to y. In case you're not familiar with them, I want to think about partial derivatives just for a moment. If I'm in two-dimensional space within region R, 
I can move around in a variety of ways from a given point. I can change the x and the y, at least within reason, completely independently of each other. So we think of x and y as being independent variables. We no longer think of y as a function of x in this context. To make this more concrete, I'm going to think of having a function f, which depends on two independent variables, x and y. f of x and y is evaluated this way. You take whatever was in the first slot and square it, raise the number in the second slot to the fourth power, and then add in the cube of what was in the first position times the seventh power of what's in the second position. When we write partial derivative of f with respect to x, we're going to pretend that y is a constant and x is the variable in the problem. When we write partial of f with respect to y, we're going to pretend that x now is a constant and it's the y that's the variable. If we can keep the context correct, then we can easily calculate these partial derivatives using the techniques we learned in elementary calculus. Following that idea, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, x is the variable, so the derivative of x squared is 2x, y to the fourth is a constant factor, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, the y to the seventh power is a constant factor. On the other hand, if you think of y as being the variable and x as being a constant, when we calculate partial of f with respect to y, I'll have the constant x squared multiplied by the derivative of the variable to the fourth power, so we'll end up with 4 times x squared times y cubed, plus x cubed is regarded as a constant. If y is the variable, the derivative of y to the 7 is 7 times y to the 6th power. This is what we mean when we say partial derivatives. We're going to do exactly the same sort of thing with integration. If I have one of these two type of things in the first, I'll pretend that y is a constant and x is the variable, and in the second one, it'll be the other way around. As a simple example of this, let's think of the integral of 2x over y integrated with respect to x. If y is a constant, the y in the denominator is a constant in the denominator. This might as well be 2x over 3 or 2x over 6 or some such thing. The antiderivative of 2x is x squared, so I'll have x squared over y plus a constant. When I say constant here, I mean it's something that doesn't depend on x. It could depend on y, though, and we would still get the correct thing when we take the partial derivative to check. The integral of 2x over y integrated with respect to y instead, the 2x is a constant factor. If y is the variable, antiderivative for 1 over y is natural log absolute y. Again, plus something that's really not necessarily a constant, it just doesn't depend on y. These are indefinite integrals. You can do definite integrals just as well. The integral from 0 to 1 of 2x over y with respect to x, we've already stated what an antiderivative is. We need not bother with the constant of integration because it cancels out anyway. For emphasis, I write x equals 0 and x equals 1. So you would have 1 squared over y minus 0 squared over y, which is 1 over y. This depends on y, but it doesn't depend on the variable of integration. It can't. 
if I look at the integral from 1 to 2 of 2x over y, but with respect to y this time, the 2x is a constant factor. The antiderivative is 2x natural log absolute y. Evaluate between y equal 1 and y equal 2. Since the natural log of 1 is 0, I don't have to write that part down. And my answer is 2 times x times the constant natural log of 2. Again, notice this depends on x, but it doesn't depend on the variable that I was integrating with respect to. In certain situations, if I want to evaluate one of these double integrals that we were speaking of, there's a simple way to do it, at least conceptually. If my region is bounded on the left by a vertical line, x equal a, bounded on the right by a vertical line where x is b, bounded below by some function of x, y equals alpha of x, and above by some other function, y equal beta of x, then according to Fubini's theorem, the double integral of a region r of f of x and y with respect to area can be calculated in the following way. You integrate from a to b with respect to x, the integral from alpha of x to beta x, f of x and y, with respect to y only. When we do these integrals, we will do them in the manner that we were just talking about. I can't emphasize enough, this inside integral is with respect to y. After you find an antiderivative, if you can, you will substitute y equal alpha x and y equal beta x in for the y, and in the end, the result still may have x's in it, but it can't have any y's. So you could call that inside integral the inner function. You could call it i of x equals the inside integral. If you can figure out a way to calculate that quantity, or at least estimate it, then the problem turns into an ordinary calculus one type interval, which in principle you could do with a variety of techniques. So as an example, let's calculate the double integral over region R of function f of x and y with respect to area, where to be specific, f of x and y is 6x plus 12y, and the region, r, is a triangle that lies in the xy plane in the first quadrant, bounded by the y-axis, the x-axis, and the straight line x plus y equals 5, which, by the way, tells you that y is 5 minus x. If you look at this picture, x is going to be the outside variable, so the x can go from 0 to 5 regardless of what the y does, but the y is restricted. For a given x value, y could be 0, it could be a little bit bigger than 0, it could be somewhat bigger than that, but it can't be bigger than the y coordinate on that downward sloping straight line. So when I do the integral with respect to y, y can go from 0 up to 5 minus x. And of course, the thing that we're integrating is 6x plus 12y. So we have two levels of computation to do here. We have to calculate the inside integral, the integral from 0 to 5 minus x of 6x plus 12y, with respect to y, thinking to ourselves, y is the variable and x is a constant. The result of that can't depend on y, but it can depend on x. So grinding through the usual techniques, in the end, if I've done my computations correctly, the inside integral is 150 minus 30 times x. As expected, it doesn't depend on y, but it does depend on x.
To finish the problem, since we have found the inside integral, all we have to do is to find the integral from 0 to 5 with respect to x of 150 minus 30 times x, which is straightforward and turns out to be 375. So if the region is nice, we can split Fubini's theorem integral up into an iterated integral, do them one at a time, and be done with it. Of course, this is predicated on the assumption that we can do the antiderivatives involved. If we can't, we've been studying numerical methods for integration. We can apply our methods. We could apply the left-end rule, the right-end rule, the midpoint rule, trapezoid, or even Simpson. As we said before, we're going to find a way to calculate the inside integral, the integral from alpha of x to beta x, f of x and y dy. People often get confused about this. The answer can depend on x, so I don't want to tell you a numerical value for the x. I want to be able to find this function i of x for a given x value that you give to me. Once we know how to do that, then we can estimate this integral by using any of our methods. I'll think of using the trapezoidal method in order to calculate the inside integral. This calls for clear thinking. x is a constant. It's a constant that's given to me, and Given that constant, I wish to evaluate i at x, which is an integral with respect to y. So it's the y variable that I'm going to have to worry about here in my numerical integration method. y can be as small as alpha of x or as big as beta of x. So if I divide that range up into n sub y subintervals, each one of them is going to be beta of x minus alpha x over n sub y long. This is how I'll calculate my delta y. What do we do in the trapezoid rule? Inside the brackets, there are two terms which represent the extreme indexed function values. So I want to put in the smallest y value that I can have and the biggest y value. So the smallest y value is alpha of x and the biggest is beta of x and you're thinking to yourself what about those x's? I don't care about those x's. x is a constant. What else do you do? You add up all the function values with indexes 1 up to n sub y in this case, minus 1, and double those. So we will add up y1, y2, up to y in y minus 1. x is a constant. And double that. This is going to be and then, of course, multiply by delta y over 2. This will be my trapezoid rule approximation to the inner integral. And once I know how to do that, which I do, we'll use that in another trapezoid rule approximation to approximate the double integral. So, to be clear about it, the outer integral will be done this way. Select a number of subdivisions of the x range, n sub x. The width of each subinterval will be b minus a over n sub x. I'm going to calculate i at the smallest x value, i at the biggest x value. The other function values for i, I'm going to add up double and then multiply by delta x over 2. So as long as we can keep the context straight, 
this shouldn't actually be that difficult. I think when I write my code, which we'll talk about in the next meeting, I'll probably call the function f literally f every place in the code, and I'll probably call the i function enter or something so that I can keep i as a loop index.